Jamie wants to have that conversation. I didn't want to have that conversation. I can still, Jeff, I can still envision the office, the room that I was in, the window that, I mean, I can like envision the whole thing. It was so gut-wrenching. It sucks to tell somebody that, I mean, they kind of suck at what they're doing. But then it was also like being able to frame it in the context of like, so now let's find a better fit. Welcome to 99 Humans. My name is Jeff LaCosta, curious coach and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, striving to understand how little things generate big impact. And I'm Nadia Carta, tech executive and lifestyle coach with a mission to transform lives and corporations by kindling hearts to generate a zeal for life. Each week, we investigate stories about the human side of leadership to re-energize your spirit and help you become a stronger leader. Because the reality is that leadership is messy, goofy, challenging, but always human. Thanks for spending time with us today. Let's dive in. I came in as a product manager under the computer assisted surgery, the navigation division. I was there, there were like four product lines. And after Not too long, I got bumped up to be head of marketing for the whole division, which obviously creates an interesting dynamic in that the people who had been my peers, right, suddenly I was managing. For the most part, my approach was very much inclusive and, you know, team oriented and, you know, let's figure this out together. And I think people would say, like, Awesome. There was a, I've had people over the years say, I look back at that team and it was like the most special, you know, group. I, the, the whole thing was magical in so many ways, except I come around to his first performance review. He was a bright guy. He was a nice guy. He was absolutely horrible as a product manager who had to be internal customer facing, but even more challenging for him was the external customer facing role. Mm -hmm. So in that role, you had to be out with surgeons all the time and with them during, you know, through days of surgery and with them at dinners afterward. And so lots of direct interaction and the role was really built on relationships, right? The strength of relationships. I go into its review time and we're probably nine months in. And so I type up my review. And I say, basically, you know, and I'm going, this is, it's hard for me because I know I'm going to have to deliver this message, right? But it's important and I don't, he has strengths. He's really good at the technical side. He's really good, you know, at more of the operational behind the scenes piece, but he's really bad at this the main part of his role. And so I had to sit down and type this all up. And the way the reviews worked were you typed up your review and then it went to HR for approval before you had the conversation with employee. So I type it up. I try to frame it with some positives around it. Goes off. I get an email back that says, you can't do this. He's never gotten a bad review. And in the whole time that he's been here, and this is unacceptable, this isn't going to work. Mike, well, Mm. that's funny, because I'm, I mean, to the point that surgeons would like get up and leave dinner and go (laughs) somewhere else. I mean, right, this was not just me saying this. This was anyone who was observing. So the fact that he'd never had a negative review in this role just blew my mind. So anyway, I'm like, you know, really need to discuss this. This is These are absolutely true observations. I'm not saying the guy isn't nice and talented in other ways, but I think we should focus on his strengths and, you know, get, find a different place for him. And the organization, a massive organization, surely there's somewhere that's a better fit. So I go to HR. They were like, well, we need to discuss this in person. I go to HR, come to find out that the head of HR was his sister-in-law and he had just been in the wedding six months prior wow and therefore we were not going to say anything bad about him and no one had ever said anything bad about him 
the extent of nepotism within that company like blew my mind as I started piecing it together. But so I realized that was what was coming into play and people did not want to be mean to him. So, which is a really interesting place to be. And oh. so it basically got elevated to the head of the division and I had to sit down and I was relatively new at that. I mean, I'm a year and a half, you know, half in max. And so I had to sit down with the president of the division and explain why I in good conscience could never give him a better review than I had given him. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I told him I would connect him with a number of sources that would absolutely validate the observations. And so it put me in a horrible, I mean, it was a horrible position to be in and really challenging, you know, I mean, nepotism and unforeseen dynamics and, you know, trying to be candid and honest. And so basically I said, I refuse to give a revised version of this. To reiterate, one of the points that I would like to make in all of this is that he does have strengths, and I would like to point out what those strengths are and help to find him. Perhaps we can brainstorm other opportunities within the division or the company that would be a far better fit for him. But the whole situation just blew my mind. <laughs> like, How did it go when you had that conversation with the division head? He agreed with me. He did. I mean, it took a while because he was connected to all kinds. I mean, I like really can't even explain the extent of nepotism with them. And so I did. I sat down and I said, <laughs> I just want to have a candid conversation. With Those are never easy conversations, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the performance review piece and the hiring and the firing, all of that is so hard on so many levels. And so... I had to explain to him that I thought he was a phenomenal person and that he brought, you know, I saw these as his strengths and that I quite frankly thought that the role was not a great fit for him and that I thought we should, you know, and then I tried to dig into like, well, what do you love about the role? Right. I mean, what is it that really excites you about it? And so what was interesting is that as we went into that conversation, he kind of acknowledged that wasn't his favorite part of the role. That wasn't really what drove him every day to be engaged. It was really some of these other underlying, again, more technical, more operational. Those were the things that really excited him about the role, which the exact opposite, basically, of the customer facing aspect and the, you know, with all the divisions within the company that he had to interact with, like, that wasn't really what he loved anyway. And so it was a really painful way of getting around to, he actually found a role within hmm. operations that was a great fit. You know, wow. but it was a bizarro thing to navigate on so many levels. So the thing that sticks out to me the most is the emotion that must have existed in the rationale and just the roller coaster. How did you think about managing that? I think I had such conviction that that he was not a good fit. So it would, I would watch it hinder not only his performance and therefore the success of the role and therefore the success of the, you know, department and therefore the success of the division, right? I mean, it kind of goes all the way up. Like ultimately the success of the company is dependent on all these layers working together and working well and successfully. And this is a piece that is not. This is not a good fit. So I think I had such conviction with it that even when I hit the wall at HR, which I then realized when everybody said, oh, he's never had a bad review. Like now, at once I understood the familial dynamic, I was Spidey like, sense oh. is tingling there. <laughs> yes. I'm like, he's never had a bad review because nobody wants to say anything to him. Mm. Like, so then it was even further conviction that, no, this is going to be challenging. Nobody wants to have that conversation. I didn't want to have that conversation. I can still, Jeff, I can still envision the office, the room that I was in, the window that, I mean, I can like envision the whole thing. It was so gut-wrenching. It sucks to tell somebody that, I mean, they kind of suck at what they're doing. But then it was also like being able to frame it in the context of like, 
so now let's find a better fit, right? Yeah. To understand what moves you anyway, and then to understand that it really, I mean, even from his perspective, nobody had the guts to tell him, but it, it wasn't a fit from either side. So that gut wrenching, like pre preparation for that hard conversation <laughs> resonates, I think will resonate with everybody who hears this story. Anything surprise you about that conversation that maybe was different than the gut wrenching experience you expected? With the conversation with Curse Company X. X. <laughs> <laughs> Company X. Nothing <laughs> surprising. I guess, I mean, it was a very candid conversation, right? I mean, there was no other uh, sugar coating, it didn't seem to be good. But I was also. I guess impressed for somebody who had lacked personal skills, it was almost like he latched on to what the recognition of his own weaknesses and that maybe there actually was something else that he would like to do better. I mean, mm -hmm. he'd been in the role for a long time. Right? I was new and, you know, it, I got promoted. He did not. Right. I mean, it was like, and we were kind of in a similar space. So I actually think that once he kind of took a moment to absorb it, the fact that he kind of came to recognize it and we were able to move on from it, you know, it's kind of like sometimes people are looking for an out. They may not mm -hmm. always love what they're doing. Yeah. And so it's almost like if you give them permission, right? You're setting the stage and giving them permission, whether it's, you know, I mean, and I've had this conversation over time with different people, like, are you really all in, right? I feel like hmm. you had great passion two years ago, and I feel like that's missing. Like, what's missing? What do you really care about? Are you fully on board with this team, this company, whatever, right? So some, I do feel like sometimes people are just looking for an out, for permission to do something different. You feel obligated. I'm on the board of Mar March of Dimes here, right? And it's been, it's so interesting because some of the board is like these, they've been there forever. And so it's like, you just watch this, it's stagnant. And so the, it's been fun to come in and like a couple of other new people and energy and whatever. And it was funny because the executive director called me and she was like, so I don't know what to do with this. I feel like we're stagnant, you know, and we went through it. And it was funny because I said the same thing to her. I mean, I said, I think that sometimes in that or in a job, sometimes people take on that responsibility and they don't want to let people down, mm -hmm. right? They don't. So they feel this commitment. They feel this sense of obligation. And once it becomes an obligation and not a passion. And so she was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get them out. And so my suggestion, which actually ultimately led to a few people self-selecting out, was to go to every person and say, you know, hey, I understand you've been doing this for 10 years. God, we're so appreciative of your service. Like, can you tell me why this resonates with you? Like why this is so important to you? Why, mm -hmm. you know, you continue to commit so much, right? And there were three people that went, oh, Glenda, I've been on it for a long time. <laughs> like I originally started because of this, but wow, that's kind of faded over time. And so it's been um, cool wow. to watch like that. So it, to me, it's kind of the same thing, right? It's like, helping people in whatever context find their passion and giving them that permission to, take a different step, pursue a different direction. I love that. Christy, it's incredible. On um, in both of those examples, you use the word conviction. And I know this about you, <laughs> but I think that's something that's really hard to have. And especially for gut-wrenching conversations to feel, oh, I've got to do this. We've got to talk to these board members and see if they're on board, because I know they're not. <laughs> right. How do you get that confidence? That's a great question. I don't know. I guess, I mean, I guess I say I, you are the same. Like you were raised to, you know, try to evaluate what's right and wrong and kind of that strong sense of ethics and purpose. And it's almost like there's something feigned about it, right? When somebody's 
whether by their own choice or, you know, because of the move through a corporate ladder or whatever, right? If it's not, if it's not honest in any way, and I mean, it's just not the right thing, right? I mean, from any direction, you, people should be held accountable and it's for the greater good. I mean, I think, I truly believe it is for the good of the individual and the greater good. Yeah. Right. So at some point it's, I don't know, it's never easy in those, that type of situation. All right. So someone reads your story and they, yep. you know, hear this experience that you had, what takeaway would you give to them? I, you know, I kind of like from a logistical perspective, think about the performance management, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is never easy. It can be messy. It. Usually there, I think that if there is a candid performance management review, that it should include positive and negative, kind of the identification of strengths and weaknesses in employees, right? Which, you know, I think a lot of times that happens. People, for whatever reason, people get promoted or they get put in roles where it may not be a good fit, right? And then if it's not, kind of helping to redirect. Yeah. I mean, and there's also nepotism, a whole lot of internal dynamics. <laughs> like, I hope that's like, not something that's everywhere, but it might not be. I mean, it might, maybe it'll be a recurring in. theme for that's you. Crazy. Yay. Oh, I hope that's not a chapter. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Just, uh, that does. And I think you, I love how you said, you know, don't sugarcoat it. I think right. that's a, like the candor is huge. I do. I genuinely believe that. I mean, I don't think, I don't think it serves anyone well, right? It doesn't serve the individual well, and it certainly doesn't serve the company well. It's easier, but it doesn't serve anyone well.